3D and JRs, you are in for a treat today on this podcast episode. Uh, for those who are not aware, Alberto Nunez, Coach Nunez, our very own, uh, recently released uh, Prep Positioning, a course where he goes into what's the ideal way to position yourself to have a really successful prep. And he talks about basically if you could start off on the best foot as a bodybuilder, what would that look like? And if you're an intermediate, what mistakes did you make along the way that you can now rectify? And how do you really make sure that you've got the fundamentals and the foundation in place? Now, we're probably not going to create a powerlifting course like that, uh, just because it's a smaller sector of our audience. But we do have that skill set. We do have that experience. We've coached a lot of powerlifters. Uh, and we thought it'd be really cool to have a discussion about that among our coaches who specialize in powerlifting. So I am here. Uh, with head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, uh, Brad Loomis, <laughs> as well as uh, Jesus Risen, Alberto Nunez, his hair down today. Um, so for those who are watching on YouTube, you will get that joke. If you're just listening to the podcast, you're probably thinking Eric is on one today and just fast forward 15 seconds uh, and we'll get to it. But today we're going to talk about how do you set up the early stage of your career as a power lifter perfectly to put you in the best position. And this is not to say that if you didn't do this, that you've made some mistake or you can't regain that old time, but it might tell you what holes are in your game currently as an intermediate. So you can go, you know what? Here's how I want to try to patch some of those holes up my game, shore up some of those blind spots. And for any coaches out there who work with powerlifters, it'll really help you set them up on the right foot from the start. So uh, I'm gonna start with you, Alberto. Please tell me, what do you see as the, probably some of the key fundamental things that you wish every powerlifter had uh, is one of their goals when they first kick things off. Ooh, um, well, I, I'd say start with, um, that's one thing I like about powerlifting is that it's very standardized in regards to the rule book, you know? So I think it'd be a, a good idea to just understand the, the rules of the, the game quite thoroughly, you know, mm -hmm. um, like what's deep enough as a squat. Um, how long do you have to pass a, pass a, a pause the bench, the commands, um, you know, maybe even the different equipment from federation to federation because, you know, when you're scouting gyms, that's, that's going to be important, especially as you get closer to, to that platform time. Um, so I would probably start there. It's like, let me learn a little bit about this sport. Uh, I'd probably nerd out a little bit on the history as well. Uh, probably start looking at, um, at a few lifters and, and, and just, you know, just becoming kind of a fanboy of it. Right. Because when you decide, hey, this is one, what I want to go for. Um, I know for me, I was like the one free kid that kind of wanted to do the bodybuilding thing and a little powerlifting as well. Um, yeah, it's just a good way to just feel a little bit more more involved. But that'd be the first thing is just open up the rule books. Um, and, and thankfully for just about every fed, I think like you can they're, they're just a Google search away these days. I love that answer, actually, Berto, and I didn't think we were going to start there, and now I can't think of not starting there. That's such a great opening. It's basically saying, hey, within every group of humans, there's a community, and a culture stems from that. So if you want to get into powerlifting, you want to have it to be a cultural experience. Um, and I also think that's important because a lot of people get it in their head, especially if their initial exposure is, say, Instagram, where they're looking at the top lifters that to be accepted or to be good enough, quote unquote, or okay, you have to be strong as shit. But that's 100% not the case. Uh, there is a huge powerlifting community. There are people who haven't done a meet in 20 years, and now they sit on uh, a board uh, for, for one of these organizations. They show up in referee. They load plates. They contribute to the community in the way they can. Uh, and it's really appreciated. Um, you know, and like what powerlifters respect is people who give it their all and participate in the same thing that we all mutually love. And that's true of most communities, you know? So I would 100% agree with that. Um, Brad, Berto, what do you guys think about maybe something that, that would be a recommendation for people who are interested in potentially competing in powerlifting just to go to a local meet and watch just to get a feel for it? Yeah, that's um, that's how I got kind of exposed to it you know i was i was a, a meathead you know bodybuilder just like a lot of our audience you know and then i met these folks at this bodybuilding competition and found out that you know our, our good uh, eric helms was was going to be doing a, a powerlifting meet and i was like oh yeah 
that sounds like fun. You know, I think I want to go to that and I want to go watch it, you know, and it totally changed a lot of my perception uh, of what I thought uh, powerlifting was. Cause I'll, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I found powerlifting intriguing, but only because I had, you know, magazines from like the nineties, you know, and the eighties. And, and I, I was kind of seeing what was, you know, kind of going on there. And, and those were all of my, my, um, you know, my, what I knew about powerlifting. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, once I actually went on, I mean, I felt good enough to take my son to it, you know, and he was only shoot what six at the time. Um, and, and we, both of us, you know, we both of us had a ball, you know, cause I kind of feel like a lot of people that are, are interested, intrigued uh, with powerlifting, they've already kind of delved into their, call it their fitness journey, their, their bodybuilding journey, whatever. They've kind of started lifting, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's, it's, they've kind of gotten that love for it. Like we, you know, got early on, um, and, and, you know, I think a, a, a good way to, to level up is to say, okay, well, let's see what it's like to compete. And then, you know, like Berto said, maybe then I can start kind of in, incorporating some of that, that stuff into my training and what I, you know, do at my local gym. That's well said. And I, there was a door that I opened and you walked right through it, Brad, and I appreciate that. <laughs> so we're going to take a, a very brief trip down memory lane, folks. 2009. February 28th, I remember the day. That is the powerlifting meet uh, that, that you attended. Um, that was my, geez, I think my first competition of the 09 season that I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole 3DMJ crew was there. And Brad came and watched it. You brought Sander. And just to give people an idea of how much powerlifting is about community and not so much just about the numbers you put up. I was warming up with my last warm up before my opener on deadlift, which was 405, and over walks Mr. Stan Efforting, and he says, hey, do you mind if I warm up on that as well? And I said, of course. And for those that don't know, Stan Efforting, IFBB pro bodybuilder, one of the strongest men in the world, pretty popular op- entrepreneur. He's well known in our community, and that was, I would say, right around also the, the beginning of the peak of his popularity. And for those who don't know, Stan Efforting is a very vocal lifter, for one, and he's also incredibly strong. Um, he was one of the first ones who popularized raw lifting at this time point. And he likes to do a deadlift like he initiates it as a leg press, just holding on and pushing with his legs, and then he locks out. So the way he actually warms up with his lighter weights, which, yes, includes 405 when you can deadlift over 800, um, was he, he grabs it and does, like, the start of a leg press and then rows it. So he'll lift it up to about the knees, and then he explosively rows it into his waist. So after I pull a slow single at 405, because my final attempt ended up being 500, um, he goes over and does like five to six barbell rows explosively with 405. And I was like, (laughs) yes, I am not strong. This is Stan Efferding. (laughs) And he was just kind, awesome. Everyone cheered for everybody. It didn't matter so long as you you went for your best lift. And uh, that was at the old Body Tribe in Sacramento. Shout out Chip Conrad, who was recently on Iron Culture, and we did some reminiscing. But I think... Uh, Chip and the American Powerlifting Association, APA at that time, did such a good job of formulating a community. And Brad, I don't want to speak for you, but I know that the feeling of what it was like to go to those meets in Sacramento probably influenced you to go, you know what, I want to host meets. And you hosted the Billy Funk Invitational, uh, and you also hosted actually the the quote-unquote World Championships in 2011 at your own gym which was great. Now, granted, this was a world championship in so much as someone traveled all the way from New Jersey to compete in it. And we had about 50 competitors. So, but nonetheless, that mom and pop community feel uh, was awesome. And it's something that I think you just dove dove right into head first. I don't want to speak for you. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think the thing that really surprised me at the time was it's more popular now, obviously, but Mm -hmm. you had like little females you know, I think there was a little 40 year old gal that was like 123 pounds uh, that was lifting. And I just remember vividly that they, they were squatting, I think, 135 pounds, you know, like 60 some kilos and and nobody cared. You know, it was just mm-hmm. everybody was was cheering them on. And yeah, it was I don't know. It was just such a I just remember it to this day. It was just such a a community, you know, and it, it kind of blew my mind and um, blew kind of what my 80s and 90s magazines, um, you know, kind of programmed me into thinking what powerlifting was. Um, 
and so and yeah, I mean, kind of circling back to to kind of the topic here, um, I can absolutely see you know where someone else would kind of fall in love with that that same thing, and when you see it firsthand, um, I, I could see the excitement would 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 happen that like I want to do this because I I lived that as well. Yeah, I mean your your wife Jamie got into competing for mm-hmm. a good bit there, probably because of that same experience. I think most people, when they thought powerlifting, even in the mid two thousands or late two thousands, they they thought of six foot, three hundred pound men uh, wearing multi ply suits, squatting out of a monolift, yelling mm-hmm. at each other. Um, and nothing against those guys. A lot of those guys are actually big teddy bears if you get to talk to them. But yeah, the the scene is w- allowed itself to become much more inclusive than than it appeared to be at that time. And that was also my experience when I got into it. I was a little intimidated first time I did a meet. But next thing you know, you know, you look up today and it's 40% women and there's representation ac- across almost all the weight classes. It's not necessarily what it appeared to be. So anyway, the point being, and I don't want to spend you know too much time on this, is just that uh, there is a community you can be involved and it's super open, which is great. Um, and that was one of the things that really drew me and made me want to do meets uh, early on. And I had a lot of fun, like back in the day, Berto, we did you know, 07 meets after our season. Uh, and we competed in, oh, we competed basically every year that I lived in Sacramento, I think. And, and then mm-hmm. Brad started jumping in, you know, after he met us in 09 as well. So with, with that said, uh, if Berto, if you see that the first step is like, yo, get involved, get some appreciation for its history, the people in it and the ways you can contribute. What do we see as step two? What it, it, I think it kind of depends where you're coming from, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me set the scene then. So let's say we've got somebody, and like Brad said, which I totally agree with, most people get into powerlifting once they've established a couple things. I've been in the gym. I've made some gains, enough to think I wouldn't mind doing this in a semi-competitive environment at the very least. And my one of my foci, uh, at the very least, is getting stronger and using barbells to do so. So if we've got that established, and let's say we've got someone who's been lifting for a year, and they go, you know what? It'd be cool to get on the platform. Then, then what do you see a step two? Ooh. See, I guess I got to throw a wrench in there too, because I, I think when we started lifting weights was like the, the fitness, the, the body recomp enthusiasts, like we almost had a monopoly on it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, right. So now it's like, you can go through the gram, like, let's just say you're a, um, a, a, yeah, a female who is trying to change the way she looks and you stumble upon a collection of powerlifters and you're like, wow, I really like the way they look, you know, and they're not mm-hmm. doing the typical things. Like I'm not seeing what they eat. Um, you know, uh, maybe there's candy at the gym, but and that sounds pretty fun. Um, and, and they're strong. Um, and that's just, that's a physique that, man, I think I'd like something like that for myself. Um, so, you know, I, I think, I guess it can be your first contact now. Uh, whereas when we started, it was typically gym rats where it's like, Hey, I could bench 315. Let me, mm-hmm. let me go put this up in a meet and get it certified. Um, so I guess, look, if, if you are a gym rat, uh, or, or say, yes, I think now with the, especially in the USAPL, you see this, you see a lot of guys that, and gals that, Hey, I used to do this sport and, uh, yeah. kind of lifted weights anyway, lifted weights anyways. I mean, jump into this. So I think for them, like their route would probably be a little bit more uh, powerlifting specific, right? Yep. Whereas I, I think someone like uh, the example of someone who is um, inspired by a so-and-so powerlifter, because um, I think this was a huge advantage for, for you and I, Eric, and that was the fact that we had a nice muscular base. And I think especially early on, um that's probably what's going to impact your strength the most. So I would say early on, if, if you are someone with like limited lifting uh, experience, it would probably be good to start off with a program that I think relative to someone who's a more seasoned powerlifter, it's going to be a little bit less, uh, I guess, sports specific. There's going to be a little bit more bodybuilding uh, in there while we're waiting for those lifts to, to cook up and, and you to really find your, your groove there. So, mm-hmm. uh, whereas like, Hey, someone who's a D one athlete, you know, tore their ACL, you know, they're looking for something new. 
I, I think with them, it's like you can almost immediately throw them into like, hey, let's let's give you a, a nice little light block and and let's see, let, let's watch nature take its course. Absolutely, yeah. People with with an athlete background are going to have a f- far more muscular base than than most people coming into it, and probably have some SNC experience that includes at yeah. least like. Mm-hmm crappy power cleans and, and partial squats, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some nice bounce benches with the butt in the air. So it doesn't take too much retooling to get, to get some of those things down, but no, I a hundred percent agree. It's just, just throw some data behind it. Um, when you look at studies that look at the anthropometrics or the body dimensions and body composition of elite level strength, lef- uh, strength athletes, uh, especially in power lifters, you see what discriminates between higher and lower performers, even among elite elite athletes, is really comes down to how much muscle mass do they have. Um, however, to become an elite athlete, you actually have to have a high level of technical skill and all the other adaptations that come from lifting weights. Um, now, I will say, I, I actually totally agree with you, Berto. I don't know why I said actually, like that's a surprise to the listener. But <laughs> I, I totally agree with you <laughs> in that, um, like, if you think about it this way, there is only so much practice a beginner can get with any new skill, right? So if you said, I want to get good at drawing, and you started drawing 12 hours a day, I'd be like, yo, you need to slow your roll. For one, you've yeah. never drawn before, so a little bit of drawing is going to have all these new insights for you to get. Like, oh, that's how hard I need to push, and oh, okay, here's shading, and oh, I, I'm not good at drawing circles yet, or whatever. And I don't know. I haven't tried to draw since I was you know, three or whatever for the first time. But the idea is any, any new skill you develop, small dose gives a huge response. And also, because you're trying to learn so many things simultaneously, there is a cap to how much of that practice can be deliberate and effective instead of just frustrating and kind of burn you out. So do you need to go on a program where you're squatting three or four times a week, benching four or five times a week, and deadlifting one to three times a week? Probably not. Um, You know, how much practice do you really need with the lifts? I would say hitting each one, like one to three times per week at most, depending on the lift. And at the start of your program, kind of looking at it as a skill component before then moving on to other exercises, because let's, let's be for real, like you can a hundred percent build a crap ton of muscle with squats, bench and deadlifts. But I don't know if we should have novices spending a bunch of time doing three by 10 on back squats and bench and deadlift. There are probably better tools for that. And honestly, just more exposures to new movements and getting familiar with the gym. So playing with dumbbells, playing with inclines. Um, one thing I was saying before we started recording, uh, and, and while you were grabbing your charger, Berto, I was uh, saying to Andrea and, and Brad, you know, one of the things I think is important for early stage power lifters is exposure to other variations of the lifts. Because I think a lot of power lifters, they come mm-hmm. in and they go, right, it's low bar time. And then the only real question is, do I pull sumo or conventional? But everything else is a lot of comp specific lifts, especially if you kind of run in like the USAPL or IPF circles. And you will eventually get there. And you might get there a lot faster, like you said, Berto, if you come from athletic background. But in my mind, you really want exposure to all of these different variations because they might become tools to build specific lifts at specific times when you have a specific deficit that you can't anticipate at this stage of your career. And there is the the rare lifter out there who does better pulling conventional when they look like they'd be better at sumo, maybe because of hip structure or has a a back injury that, that makes it better for them to do the other one. Or maybe they're like Mr. Lewis, who can pull either way pretty big, but just can recover more quickly from a sumo deadlift, and, and that's what we end up going to. So I think it's it's really good to get exposure to all of that. So you you don't have the challenge of an intermediate who feels like it's the sunk cost fallacy. I put in three years doing this type of lift, and now I know when I switch to something that could be better for me, I have to put on all this time and effort before I get it up to the level of the other lift, so I'm just not going to do it. You know, and every time I don't like my level of progress, I get frustrated and go back to the other way of doing it. And they never really get that time or investment into properly pulling sumo or properly pulling conventional, et cetera. So I think it's it's really good from the start to have some of those lift variations in and more broadly to your point, Berto, just to have more variety in general. Nothing extreme. I'm not saying we need to have like a CrossFit program where you bolt on some singles. I'm saying you probably want to have a bit of a bodybuilding program where we kind of bolt on some singles and that those can get progressively heavier over time. So, Brad, is there anything you want to add to that? You feel that it could provide more nuance? No, actually, no. You, you. What I was going to add, you talked about right there at the end, is where you just, 
when, when you're used to doing a three by 10 and you're used to doing bodybuilding, there, there is an, a, another nuance to powerlifting and just doing the heavy work um, that like, like you talked about the singles, you know, mm. not one rep max singles, certainly, but kind of delving in there, you know, doing three singles with 70%, you know, of what you think your one rep max might be, you know, to get a little bit of an introduction into those, those officiating, um, you know, things that Berto talked about before, make sure, making sure you're hitting depth on your squat, making sure you're pausing on your chest, you know, and getting full and, and upright and locked out. Cause a lot of people kind of overlook that too. You know, they just kind of, when you do a lot of three by tens and, and, and four by eights and things like that, it's, it's, it's fatiguing, it's tiring, and you don't always lock your hips out, you know? And so you're mm -hmm. just kind of getting the reps done. And so doing heavy singles, but not one rep max singles is something that's a great little addition to your program without overhauling the whole thing. And you can kind of start working on some of those, 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 those nuances that exist in powerlifting. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you pretty much introduced exactly what I was, was, was thinking. No, you're hundred percent right. Like if you come from the typical fitness, uh, background, which like, like Berto said in our day was born bodybuilding centric, I'd say still on average, it probably mm -hmm. is and has elements of that. There's certainly not a, a large beginner's movement of, you know, let's, let's see what it feels like to do singles that I don't think that's a thing really. Mm. Um, but whether you come from a background of some other type of lifting or if it is bodybuilding centric, there is a common thing of you're going to be doing reps, right? that that's that's a really really normal standard thing and you approach reps differently you know like you don't think that much about your walkout because you don't need to it's only 70 percent and you don't need to think about your walkout for a 70 percent single but a 70 percent single is a really safe environment to practice the walkout you would use mm -hmm. for an attempt on the platform so i think that's a great point brad and i'm trying to remember back to when it was like 2005 2006 for me before i was really thinking about the squat bench and the deadlift as powerlifting movements and more just as like strength and size movements. And because I was doing them for like four to six reps most of the time, maybe sometimes eight, nine or 10, I would approach them differently. Like I didn't wear my belt as tight because I would need to take a lot of breaths. I would, um, like you said, blend reps sometimes, Brad, you know, like oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to get two, take a breath. I'm going to get two, take a breath. I'm going to get two. Um, you don't brace necessarily the same way. There's not a pause. But I think once you begin to treat the lifts like they are the power lifts and you're doing them to the competition standard, uh, like like Matt Gary would say, you treat them like a bolt action rifle, like set up, aim, pull the trigger, set up, aim, pull the trigger, not like an automatic weapon. like, you know, like I'm going to get mm -hmm. all these reps out. But I think you definitely approach the bar and you go about some of those little things that we don't often talk about differently when you're going, when you know in your head, I've got five reps to do. Um, and for me, a big shift was like, I might have a set of five as a power lifter on my main lift, but that's five singles in rapid succession rather than a set of five, which is, I think, a different mentality and something that um, I think can happen a lot faster if you know that's actually the goal. And if you get some coaching, you know, like this is five opportunities for you to practice your setup, your breathing, your bracing and your positioning, which I never thought of that way when I first started. Mm. So yeah, so I, I really like that. So basically kind of taking a maybe free weight centric minimalist compared to a true bodybuilding program, but a bodybuilding program, and then including some singles. I also like Brad that you didn't say like a single at 85%, you know, like if you, if you walk in powerlifting circles and powerlifting programming, the lightest you're typically going to see is like a single at a five or a six RPE, which is still like 80 to 87% of one RM. And yes, mm -hmm. that that's light. But it doesn't feel light the first time, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know, you're getting exposed to these singles. That is still like a five or six rep max, which would probably be like the heaviest load that you're used to having on your back if you come from doing a rep style program. So I think it's a great recommendation, even though it will feel easy to do singles in the 70 to 75 or, you know, 70 high 70s to low 70 percent range. I think that's a really good recommendation for, for beginner lifters who are getting used to the power lifts because it's gonna be similar to the load you're used to, but now you get to approach it differently. It's truly like I'm learning a skill. And I think that is also a big mindset shift. When you're going to the gym to work out and to, to get more fit and change your body, I don't think you really think of it like skill acquisition. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I never thought of, let me get on this chest press machine and I'm gonna treat it like I'm learning to throw darts. 
like mm-hmm. never entered my head until mm-hmm. I became a powerlifter. Am I wrong? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And you know what? With a with a bodybuilding work, I think it also. I, I guess it's it's almost like you build up a sweet tooth for that sort of training, which is important because, man, when you look at like top level powerlifting, especially when it comes to the, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll bring it back. When you look at the prime movers on like the best lifters, it's like they're very comparable to the best bodybuilders. Um, so like you're going to need those really big. And one thing that I do see now relative to when we start is like sometimes you see someone you're like man i know that this lifter right now is kind of capped because um you know based on how they're put together maybe like if they're only squatting for for muscle growth on on their quads uh it's probably not going to get the job done um and actually i had a conversation with a power lifter uh, chance mitchell who um who if you look at his quads like you would like you'd be like, okay, there's there's probably an argument here for uh, hyperplasia. Like they're that freaky looking. You'd be like, hey, there's no way. Um, and he credits that to the fact that hey, he started out uh, perhaps overly so, but you know, pretty much on, on I guess the brotastic side of things. And he learned to work really hard on on the leg presses and on his lat pull downs and and things like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, especially like when you graduate from the, I think still from the beginner to the intermediate phase, like there's still a lot of muscle to put on. And since, you know, once you get familiar with what the prime movers are like for in, in, in powerlifting, it's like, all right, let me get up on this bell squat kind of like chance does because, um, because, Hey, like that might be outside of just the technical stuff that I can probably inch out a few kilos just from, you know, taking this seriously, because sometimes with the people who skip that, those are the power lifters that sometimes you see, it's like, man, they work their butts off on the, on the, on the main lifts. But then when it comes time to do their accessory work, they're just kind of cruising through, through that section. So is it the two very different kinds of grit, like, uh, and, and they're both extremely difficult when you really get like deep into the woods. But, um, but yeah, you want to, um, build a favorable relationship with, uh, I guess that sort of suck. Mm -hmm. No, I dig it. I like it. And, um, so it's, it's, it's almost kind of taking a sidestep from the idea that there's like this spectrum of specificity in going, well, we do want specificity, but with appropriate loads where you can really be in control and, and get that specific skill development. And we also want to build that muscular base. Um, so it's not a spectrum from like the Bulgarian method of just doing heavy singles to, you know, I'm mostly bodybuilding, but rather almost the blend of the two yeah. that's appropriate for your level of experience with the kind of loads you're handling. Um, so one thing I wanted to add is also, so what, what do you do with some of your sets on the main lifts? And I think a lot of lifters, they get hung up with how to program, like, uh, okay, yeah, you, Brad said I should use seventy percent on one RM. So do I need to do a one RM test? You know, do do I do I need to do a do an AMRAP and use one of these calculators, etc.? And I think at this stage of the game, that's probably just not necessary. Like, go back to what did you do when you're in the weight room for the first month and you're like, you know what, today I'm supposed to do dumbbell chest press. You didn't do a max test and then figure out what it was. You went, all right, for eight reps. Well, well, let me let me think what I can handle. And you grab something that was probably, in most cases, unless you are a young male and there was other young males or, or women around, <laughs> you grab something far too light, right? Uh, and you were like, oh, that still feels challenging. And then each week you made some probably pretty rapid increases in what you could handle. Some of that was just acclimation and kind of reconfiguring in your head what hard meant. Like I remember when I was a personal trainer, I used to have, I had a client who did like a three, three sets of 15 on chest press with the same weight. So meaning they're not developing that much fatigue that it actually produced failure. And they're like, that's heavy. And like my exercise physiology personal trainer in my head went, you know, by definition that is not heavy. That was probably 60% of your one RM that we were working with. But if you have only been lifting weights for a few months, that's heavier than anything you've ever pressed, right? You're normally handling groceries, you know? So, um, you know, it could be different depending on your athletic background, but if you think back to that time point, you just kind of had to feel it out. And I think that's okay. Right. 
So if the first time you know you're you're tr you, you've done some rep work and you you know what you can handle on dumbbells, just take a conservative estimate of what you think is an appropriate load for your working sets, and guess what the downside of it is, go is going to light at this stage? Nothing, because mm -hmm. it's still more than you've ever lifted. You're still building the skill. It's still new. So the 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 problem with undershooting is really only something that becomes a problem once you have a low or sorry a high threshold to actually get a stimulus and progress. So if you don't know what 70% of one arm is, that's okay. Take something that you think you could do for 15 reps and or for 12 reps and do a single with it. And if it feels like super, super easy and like you could almost jump with it on your back, go up next week. No big deal. Or call that a warm up and do another single. And I think that's the type of thing that is maybe undervalued or, or maybe like because you think of powerlifting as a very specific kind of detail and data oriented analytical pursuit uh, that you think you've got to get that right. And there's really no getting it wrong when you first start. You do want to avoid overshooting. So, you know, try to ignore the fact of your ego responding to those around you or, or what they are lifting and what you think you should therefore be lifting because you have a similar height, weight or build or sex or what have you. Um, and just get in there. And then after the set, that's where there's some time to reflect. Because one skill that powerlifters do need is the ability to accurately gauge how much more do I think I could lift. It's essentially prices, the, the price is right with the barbell, you know, when you get on the platform. You don't get it if you overshoot, right? Yeah. That's a missed lift. Uh, and if you undershoot, you get it. But you want to get as close to the max you can get as possible without Bob Barker saying, oh, I'm sorry. You know, yeah. nah, nah, so nah, nah, nah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm sure we're dating ourselves here, but um, but nonetheless. So after you do that single and let's say you think it was around 70, 75 percent, you think like, how much more do, could I put on my back? And we're at a point where we're not even talking RPE yet, because if you did a single with 75 percent, that's like an RPE, like three or whatever. But you're just thinking like, well, I wonder how much load I could put on. And then as you start adding load, and once you do start doing singles in that five to six RPE range with say 85, 86, 87% of one RM or whatever that might be, at that point, I think it is really important to think, what was my, how many more reps could I do? Um, and this is prior to us actually starting to program with RIR or RPE. You wanna constantly thinking about like, how much of my, of my capabilities was that? Because that's ultimately exactly what you're gonna do on the platform. First attempt is something I think I could do for three on a bad day. All right, how much more could I go up on my second attempt but still have it be a lock? All right, third attempt, how much more do I think? And now I'm, now I'm really playing prices right. So that skill is something that you want to start off from the beginning. Berto, I remember in our time, that wasn't how powerlifters thought. It was basically second attempt was the heaviest I've ever lifted, and then I go for a PR in the third. And then whatever I think my warm-up should be for the second is my opener. And that was pretty much the way everybody did it. And if you went nine for nine, it wasn't good job. It was quit being a pansy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Back then you can get away with that because it you know, wasn't a game of inches. But, uh, but again, at this mm -hmm. point, yeah, you're not necessarily trying to compete. You're just trying to get a feel for just proper decision making, which will especially come in handy once you get to the intermediate phase because – Every day is not going to be a little bit better than the the day prior, like like it is when you first get rolling with your your powerlifting. So, um, so yeah, yeah. Um, beginner phase, like there's you almost can't mess it up, like which is uh, comforting to hear. Yeah, well, I, I was just going to add, even even like as a novice, I mean, most most novices have not yet delved into, you know, heavy five rep maxes or four rep maxes or three rep maxes, you know, they're, they're still kind of in that, the, mo the the lowest they've gone to is like six, you know, and they're working in like a six to 10 rep range. And so, yeah, just to kind of expand upon your, your advice there, you know, Eric, if you're doing things for sixes and eights and you want to start testing out this, this singles approach, well, you know, you can do X weight for six, you know, or more. So go up a tiny bit from that and do yeah. one. You know, and, and, and you, it, like, it's, like you were saying, there's, it's not for, for nothing, you know, and plus the, the, another thing that I really like about that is we always talk about progressive overload and the importance of progressive overload and progressing. Well, you know what, you've got a perfect starting point to progress from, 
because you can just go up a little bit the following week and then you can go up the following and you're going to get that skill developed of doing those singles and getting all of those little nuances figured out. But then you're also going to slowly expose yourself to what slow repetitions actually feel like, what a slow Mm. single, you know, kind of actually feels like. So yeah, for a lot of those novices out there, I'd say, yeah, you know, you could do X weight on, on anything really for six, just go a tiny bit heavier and do one. And That's it's really going to it's going to feel easy. So you know what? Do another one, you know? Mm-hmm. It, practice your skill, practice your walkout, practice your setup on bench and do another one, you know? I'm sure that you can do six singles with a, something that's a tiny, tiny bit heavier, you know, that you've done for, for sixes before. And so that's just kind of a, now you've got a little bit of a leg up, you know, on that, that beginner lifter that we just talked about. I think that's perfect. You know, one thing I like is for new power lifters not to miss lifts in the first couple of months of this new, new training style. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's because ex- it gives you the opportunity to ingrain a movement pattern that, that hopefully will still be there when it gets grindy, um, but not having the challenge of grinding to, to, mm-hmm. to establish it. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what, what you'll, you're setting them up for, that success, Brad. Like if, if, yeah, if you've done, you know, sets of six on RDLs and now you're going to pull conventional, yeah, go up, you know, 5, 10, 15 pounds from that and make it your single on a deadlift. It'll be piss easy and that's okay. So for the first couple months, you're pulling, you know, three RPEs and then four RPEs, but it won't be that long before that next 10 pound jump. You actually have to fight a little bit to keep position. And now we're getting into that phase where exactly like you said, Brad, another skill we need to build is grinding and is actually pushing our limits because yeah, like I I think Andrea's talked about this a number of times, even though she didn't really stick and love powerlifting, she did obviously get pretty strong, do a meet, but how much just a one RM can be psychological and the difference between thinking you're 10 pounds off or on the right number, especially when you get reasonably strong is really just in your head, you know, because if you can squat 500 pounds, 490 is going to be slow and feel like a max especially at an at a, at a early stage. Uh, I'll use a more appropriate number. Like if, let's say you're squatting 315, uh, at that point in your development, when you squat 305, that is going to feel like a max. You won't have that discriminator. So you actually do need to start pushing those boundaries. This is when you probably also, because you found a community, hopefully you might actually have found some people to train with or a training partner. Um, and you've got some people who can spot you. Uh, or at least you've found a good gym where there are safety racks and some of these kind of practical concerns. So you feel comfortable and safe and you are actually safe uh, pushing these heavy weights. I would like actually to someone to start missing lifts occasionally once they're maybe four or five months in because it's bound to happen. It's rare you get to go nine for nine. Of course, it's the goal. Uh, but in the process of pushing your limits, you will sometimes find them. So I think it's it's quite important to be able to find them overshoot a little bit so you can correct backwards and find, Hey, I didn't die. You know? Yep. The, 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 the bars and the pins, but that happens sometimes you have a good laugh about it. Somebody comes over, helps you out all good. You know, you can look did I get out of position or did I just think I was stronger than I was today and now I'm better at auto regulating. And I think that's a really necessary experience for people to have in a planned manner and in a safe manner. So I don't know if you guys have more to add on that specifically. Uh, I mean, I do, but I kind of want to hear what Berto has to say first. <laughs> oh, I, I was just going to go back when you said at a position. Uh, yeah, just, uh, and I think people do this a lot more casually than before. It's just filming your lifts, I think, early on, super important. Um, because what you feel isn't always what's actually going on. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, just I think from day one, it's a good idea to keep a catalog of, of your lifting. Yeah, I, man, I just want to bolster that like there's a difference like i I honestly don't think most people can feel depth without visual feedback you know Mm -hmm. and the ones who can are the ones who get in a meet and they're like oh shit i bombed out (laughs) you know or i only got my opener on my third attempt because i just basically went as deep as i thought i could possibly do it but if you have an uh you know a camera set up at hip height directly from the side and you can look and see immediately after you know what it felt like what it looked like you will start to create because of that feedback an association between those feelings and objective depth. 
Uh, and, and you're going to have that level of confidence going forward. And you can also tell like when you got out of position, like Berto was saying, and you can start correcting those technique errors, not in real time, but in like this immediate feedback time. And I think that's so valuable. And that was something we didn't have access to even, geez, like 10 years ago, you know, when we had like the first generation of, of iPhones, you could theoretically do that, but you get kicked out of the gym because people yeah. actually cared about privacy laws back then. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. I'm kind of I'm kind of getting myself sidetracked here, so hopefully uh, my recently turned 50 year old brain can bring it back around. But that's exactly how I actually learned what a, a true grinder felt like, um, and I, I just I used exactly what I just talked about. I knew that I could get 340 pounds traditionally for about five reps. So on a day that I was practicing singles, I went to 350, and I did my my first rep at 350, and I. I I was, it was surprisingly easy. And luckily on that day, I had my gigantic digital camera that had the viewfinder on it. And, you know, the wife, she captured it for me. And I was like, wow, you know what? I'm not going to go up and wait on that. I'm going to do that again, but I'm going to go deeper. I'm going to bury it because I'm pretty sure that would not have counted, you know, in a, in a powerlifting meet. And so luckily my spotter was there. I was standing in a squat cage and, and I, I, I buried it. I hit that 350 and it, it came up a little bit slow. And that was like the first time that I had actually felt like what a true grinder was, um, you know, when you're kind of using the powerlifting standards. Now, granted, it, I looked at the camera. Sure enough, I hit depth. It, it certainly didn't look slow, but I felt it. I felt what that 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 slowness kind of feels like. Um, and so, yeah, kind of circling back around, Eric, to, to what you were talking about with, you know, um, discovering and missing, missing lifts. I, I kind of feel like that's, you have to go through a couple evolutions of feeling grinders, Um and get out of your own head, you know, because mm -hmm. e I don't think there's anybody that would disagree that if you put a five rep max on your back, whether you can squat 225 pounds or you can squat 500 pounds, that's going to feel heavy on your back. It's just the, the, really the only difference is, is that if you're going to do one rep with it, you're going to, you're going to come right up with it, you know? Um, and, and if that's what you're traditionally used to, you're not going to know what it feels like unless you took that load to a fifth rep. And essentially that fifth rep, it's going to feel similar to what a grindy repetition would feel like with appropriate load on a, on the first rep. And so you got to kind of work your way into that. And if you're lucky, you'll stumble upon missing a rep. You know what I mean? You'll, you, you might kill two birds with one stone, like Berta was talking about, you know, you might kind of realize, okay, this is something I know that I can do. You miss a rep, but it wasn't because you didn't have the strength. It's because you misgrooved it. You know what I mean? You got mm -hmm. a little bit too far forward. You got a little bit too far back, you know, what have you. Um, and so you'll, you'll, you'll be able to kind of feel what misgrooving it feels like. Luckily, hopefully you didn't hurt yourself. You can throw that weight back up on the rack and then you can do it again and say, oh, okay, now I know I can get that when I'm in the proper position. And now I know what it feels like to have misgrooved something, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. That's kind of something that should be as part of your, your, of your evolution, you know? Um, and, and it just, it's kind of one of those things where you, you want to get rid of that mindset of, okay, let's find our five rep max or let's find our one rep max today. Let's put something on there, go up five pounds, put something on there, go up five pounds, go up there, and then until you fail, you know? Um, it, it, you probably need to experience what slow repetitions, what misgrooving probably feels like, you know, before you just up and try to fail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah, we forget I, that, uh, the sensation of actually lifting or just looking at your deadlift weight. And it's something that's, you know, you're, you're unsure of, but, but mostly just a sensation of having something really heavy. that's pushing your limits. Like it's your body just feels attacked. And like to us, it's like, it's one of the, I love that sensation. It, it's when you unrack something and everything in your body's wiring is telling you like, no, <laughs> no. But, but eventually you, you develop a sweet tooth for that. And you understand, you know, you slow things down in, in your brain and you understand that, you know, if I do my job and stay cool, that everything can potentially be most likely is going to be okay. Um, and once you do get to this phase, yeah, I think it's important to 
to have those lifts and, and, and for the lifter to know how to, you know, I guess, approach it with the uh, prop, proper amount of, um, I guess, beast mode, but at the same time, like remembering your cues and, and trying to stay as rational as possible. And uh, to a large extent, just kind of ignoring, uh, yeah, like everything in your body's biology is telling you like, hey, let's just, let's just put this back. Like we, we don't need to do this today. Um, that's something that through the beginner phase you don't get a whole lot of, but you know once you are in that intermediate phase, like that that should be a a, a part of the menu for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two things about that, which which you guys are both talking about. One is I I don't think you should try to fail. I think it should happen as a consequence of trying to progress and doing your best to get closer and closer to you know a heavy single and and inevitably overshooting. And so if you if you don't get there, it probably just tells you that you're making great progress or maybe you're being a little too conservative. Um, and then another side note, like you were saying, Berto, is making it feel, making that discomfort feel comfortable. It'll always feel, feel uncomfortable. It's always mm-hmm. going to give you a shot of adrenaline when you walk out something that you don't know if you're going to stand back up with it, but you think you will. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's similar to the feeling of, of, you know, doing a six rep max or going to failure on a, on a moderate set, which I think was probably an advantage that you had, Brad. You came from that max OT background, which is generally pretty close to failure and training in that four to six rep range, you know, at, at the heaviest. Mm-hmm. But the difference between figuring out what your six rep max is or deciding whether you want to go for that sixth rep is you're seeing a steady progression towards failure. You just a second ago did something that was almost near failure and you can go like, I don't think I can do that again if it was a little bit harder and you rack it. But when you walk out, let's say 405 and it's your first time doing it and the load you did before that was 365, you're not going to know until you get some experience whether you should have chose 385 or whether you should have chose 415 or that was bang on the money because it took you, you know, 10 seconds to stand up with that thing. And I think that's a very unique experience that, that you really do need to build, that that's experiential knowledge that you have to get some in, in the trenches experience with. And, and one thing is you do want to also make sure that your spotters know how to spot that, you know, because w- one thing I think I recommend that's great, getting into powerlifting with other people who are also getting into powerlifting, you're going to share that passion. I think it's ideal that, you know, you have someone in your crew or in your corner or a coach or access to even just occasionally who's more experienced. But man, I tell you what, me and Berto getting into powerlifting meets for the first time, that was a ton of fun. That was a blast. Do we know what we were doing? No. And and did we tell each other dumb shit half the time? Yes. Uh, but we also had access to some people who were more experienced. Um, but it was certainly a lot of fun, uh, that, that, that time period. And I think that's something that, that can really amplify the experience and make you more excited about it by sharing that kind of novelty. Just make sure that, like, you know not to bail when 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 you miss a squat and just to dump it uh you know not to dump a bar or to throw it backwards or anything like that like that you know how to safely get pinned basically you just kind of keep trying to get the lift even though you're going the wrong direction uh and that their spotter knows how to spot you know that they don't grab like the bar unevenly or they try to like take it from you or something like that but they you know they know how to like hug you and stand up or they know that oh you don't spot someone on a deadlift I know that might sound rudimentary, <laughs> yeah. but I think if you, if you really haven't had exposure to some of these lifts or, or what it's like to take them, you know, close to failure, I think that's important. And, you know, one thing here, I'll give you one example of something most people can relate to. How often do you get a good gym lift off from a rando mm-hmm. on bench press? Never. And I won't do it. You know, like I, I if I go into if, back in the day when I used to go to the gym and I had a heavy single on bench and I couldn't find someone I trusted to spot, I changed the program. That's how bad it can be. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You need to have uh, that kind of skill set, that confidence, and, and that's something that uh, we're, we're that it is it is an, it's an individual sport, but you need a good crew around you in certain parts. Yeah, it's a pet peeve of mine um, when someone at the gym will ask me for a spot, and to them I'm asking way too many questions. It's like, so how many reps are we going for here? Because there's three fifteen on that bench. Is this like? I, this is the fourth consecutive week you've tried this and, and failed every time up, right? Or is this going to go up for six? How do you like your lift off? How close to failure are we trying to get? It's, 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 again, it comes from the powerlifting background, but if, yeah, it's, it's like, I think like I've lifted off people like uh, benching like close to 500 pounds 
And it's very comforting when we're like on the same page versus like, just spot me, bro. So, uh, so yeah, that sort of dialogue and practice answer to that important. question. So, so what are we going for today? We'll find out. Like, l- l- let's see what I can ah, get. That's, that's or, the worst. Or, 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 that's or this the one, answer. when they say, let me get four or five. And I'm like, oh, so I'm going to do the last two. <laughs> like, you yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this motherfucker. Yeah. Oh, when they tell me, when they, when they tell me that, like, hey, we're going to find out. And it's, it's like, no, I make it very clear. I'm just not going to be your spotter today if you don't tell me where this is in your strength range. Right? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, th- I think there is something to be said on that topic. Um, I've spent the better part now of, of two years kind of trying to master self-liftoff. Um, and when I say trying to master after two years, I literally mean I'm still trying to master, but I'm getting better. I'm a whole lot better than I was. Um, and, and Eric, I love what you said there because – Especially in, in your first three to five years of powerlifting, uh, if 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 you're going for a weight that you need a lift off, you know, and you're you're desperate for it, and you don't have it or you don't trust, you know, who's going to do your lift off? Change the program, mm. lighten that up to something that you know that you can lift off yourself and that you can get for whatever it is that you're going to get. And be okay with leaving some reps in reserve or leaving some some pounds, you know, on the tree. I love that you said that because, um, it, it's it, you know, powerlifting will hopefully be something that is 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 literally a marathon. You don't need to get that weight on that day, you know. Um, and, and so, likewise with that, I mean, I can't tell you how it it really infuriates me when. I, I see on Jim Fail Nation on the gram some dude that just absolutely just berates his spotter because he spotted him, you know, when he knew that he had it, you know, and I'm like, you MFR, you know, that dude was <laughs> putting his life on the line for you to keep you safe. <laughs> And in your mind, he just ruined eight months worth of gains for you because he helped you on that rep. You know, it's just like, sometimes I just wish I could reach into the screen and just choke people, you know, (laughs) um, (laughs) treat your spotters with, with uh, the respect that they deserve. They're taking time out of their day to help you to do your thing. And trust me, bro, you didn't just waste eight months of training because that guy just spotted you barely on that new PR, you know, trust me, you're fine. (laughs) Yeah, it's just an indication that you didn't have good enough communication with 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 your spotter, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. great points. And I think, uh, yeah, this is this is one. Actually, this this leads to something else I want to talk about, which is, quote unquote, graduating to better equipment. So I can quite easily, not quite easily. I'm 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 pretty I'm, I'm confident enough to go for a new one RM if I'm squatting out of like a powerlifting rack. Like if I've got an ER rack or an Alico rack or the one I have at home, which is like an imitation Alico rack, yeah, I can set it to the exact right height where I can, you know, push my hips off off the pad and do like a little decline. And it's almost as good as if I had a liftoff. I still prefer a liftoff and comp uh, because they're good. They've done it and it helps me just a little bit. But there mm-hmm. are high level world class power lifters who prefer to have that complete control. Some of that's kind of the psychology of powerlifting, in my opinion, to have that repeated aspect of I know how to do my self lift off. I'm not dependent on having to communicate to somebody. What if I go to an international meet? Maybe they don't speak English very well or, or they're not experienced, blah, blah, blah. Uh, fair call. I think it is a good tool to have, but it's only a tool you can have if the equipment allows it. Because I remember back in the day, like if you go to 24 hour fitness, there's three places for that bar to be on the bench. And if you are tall or short, none of them are the right, are the right height, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So you're gonna be in a position where you either need to get out of your setup to unrack it and then you're not doing the bench you're trying to practice to get it out or you have to do half a rep and you're fatigued and it's going to be too heavy now so when is it actually worth seeking out a powerlifting gym and getting access to say alico equipment etc i will say if it's close to your area and if it's not a financial burden do it from the very start but not because you're the stereotypical ipf lifter who has to have everything just perfect or you you know write a three paragraph long post on IG about how your, your day didn't go that well, 
but because of the community aspect that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. right? Because you want to be around that community. But let's say there is a decent powerlifting gym close to you and has that community, but the equipment is meh. I would say go there. You want to chase community over equipment first. They're likely going to go hand in hand a lot of the times, but I, I've definitely seen times when, you know, there's a couple different gyms, maybe one serves certain needs, another one serves second, you know, other needs. I would say go to the acceptable equipment if the community's there is your first priority. But at a certain point, especially when you're thinking, you know what, I actually do want to get on the platform, which will be our next topic of when should we actually be considering doing that. Um, you want to find a place that has comp-specific equipment so you can actually practice like you play. But don't think you need to do that from the start. You really don't. It's all so new. You know, you're developing the skills. Like, sure, it'd be great if you have access to it, but I wouldn't sacrifice any of the other aspects we talked about, especially not community, in search of the perfect equipment uh, early on in your career, because really it's all going to be new and uh, it's going to be a continual process. So that's just one thing I wanted to add. Um, yeah, so when do we want our, 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 our this, this, this hypothetical powerlifter or soon to be powerlifter to actually pop their cherry and, and actually get on the platform? <laughs> Man, I'd say... Um, which is going to look different for everyone. I'd say that early intermediate phase is probably a a good time. Um, yeah, like man, even with my bodybuilding, like I, well, if there is one regret, is that I didn't compete when I was a teenager because I would have figured out so many things. Like, like oh, you need to count calories, right? Um, mm. Right, stuff, stuff like that. So. I think sometimes, yeah, people get caught up with like how perfect it needs to go, you know, what sort of splash they need to make upon the sport. Uh, what wouldn't be like, what would be good numbers is, is, is probably the most common one. Uh, but man, it's, you know what, if, if you go to a meet the way we suggested early on, you see that it's not that big of a deal that it's just like, yeah. okay, let me, let me, let me go in there and give this thing a, a trial run. But, um, but, but but look, it looks easy. It looks simple. I think you overcomplicate it when you've never seen a meet. Um, but then there's certain aspects that you don't learn until you're actually like they're doing it. Where uh, like for example, that rest period in between attempts like goes by really quick. You know, do you you know how to put on your wraps quite well when you know you're there training alone at the gym. But when the timer's on, it's it's you totally forget how to do the simplest of tasks, right? Uh, like I've seen lifters forget their belts, for example, like mm. quite often, right? So, um, so yeah, I think early intermediate phase, because one thing you can learn about powerlifting is that um, like creating good runways is important. Like when you start a training block, when when you're you're a bit stronger, like you know you don't go hard from day one. And same thing when it comes to your total, it's like hey, you want to see that thing be certified and then have it progress over time. So. Um, yeah, early intermediate, probably a little bit sooner than most people feel, in my experience. Mm -hmm. How about you, Brad? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of thoughts really kind of pop into my my little pea brain. Um, kind of uh, uh, getting away from like years and in, in, in time frames, kind of so to speak. Um, I, I, I kind of like certain milestones, you know, mm. like so many people, you know, that, 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 that start thinking about powerlifting, they, they, they ask what seems like very simple questions, but at the same time, they're very valid. Like, you know, should I get a, a power, a, a, a weightlifting belt? Should I get a powerlifting belt? Should I get double prong, single prong? Should I get a lever belt? You know, kind of things like that. Should I, should I be lifting in sleeves and, in and, and wrist wraps and kind of stuff like that, you know? And so I, the, my my answer to that is yeah you're gonna find that you're going to be able to lift more weight you know with with those kind of things, and I don't want your your first time on the platform to be when you start using that stuff you know what I mean, um, so yeah I, I, regardless of 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 level you know I kind of want you to have lifted in your 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 good a lot of times I'll tell people let's first of all see if you even like lifting in a belt let's just get a cheapie let's just get a cheap leather whatever thing at Walmart and get you going in that first but then of course let's get you in a good power lifting belt you know and get you lifting in that thing for probably a good maybe a couple mesocycles of training you know a few months in that thing let's get you 
you know, in a, in a, a pair of, of IPF certified sleeves, find out if you even like being in those and then let's find out, you know, yeah, let's get in those things for, for, you know, a few months and, 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 you know, just things like that. I want them to be comfortable in those things and kind of have that dialed in before we even really get into our, our peaking block, you know, and our, our, our kind of 12 week, 13 week, eight week prep, whatever it is that we plan for the, the, the peaking before the meet, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, little, little milestones like that, where we kind of figure out their gym bag in a way, you know, um, possibly even have them lift in a singlet a couple of times, you know, we're going to do that anyway, kind of as we're, we're, we're doing our preparatory block, but maybe get in that a couple of times, you know, um, I'd, I'd hate for you to, 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 you know, get into your preparatory block or last minute, figure out that, you know what, your quads are now bigger and that singlet doesn't fit you anymore, you know, or it's just riding up too much or, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, I think outside of the time frames that, that Berto mentioned, which are obviously very important, just certain milestones, I kind of feel like they, they, they need to, to have happen, you know? Probably would have been a good idea that you actually did safely miss a couple of times, you know, um, even even though arguably, a, 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 you know, a, a good um, way to go is that you haven't missed. You know, that's a, a good sign of progression, you know, but I, I kind of would like to, to actually have missed a couple of times. I don't want your first time missing when you're on the platform or when we're doing that that all important preparatory block, you know. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, just little milestones like that are kind of something that I kind of think of as well. I love it. You talked about milestones and, and, and nary a single lifting standard came out of your mouth. And that's one of the most common misconceptions I think beginners have. Like, is it okay if I do a meet when I can only squat three plates or squat two plates or squat mm -hmm. four plates, you know, depending on their, their yeah. sex and age and weight class division? Um, that's a very, very common question. And, and that's, that's not important, believe it or not. I know it's the sport of lifting as much as you can, but really it is, do you have the experiences we've talked about? Have you ingrained a movement pattern via going appropriately moderately heavy uh, and really building the skill and then it kept going and progressively overloading until, hey, you, maybe you actually missed one of those times and you've developed now a better sense of how much do I have in the tank? And have you built an appreciable amount of muscle mass? And have you attended a meet? And then have you gotten used to the right equipment that you're going to train on, uh, the, the training in it so that you can actually compete on it once you're at this point? I think that's a good idea. And then have you got your gym bag set up, like Brad said? Those are all the real milestones I think we want to pay attention to. Uh, and yeah, just to kind of reiterate what you said, Brad, I love the idea of doing an actual mock meet where you give yourself, you know, mm -hmm. five minutes between lifts, 15 minutes between, uh, you know, the actual movements. Maybe even, you know, between the squat and bench and the deadlift, you grab lunch, you come back, you know, mm. and you lift in a singlet, you, you have, you know, you, you lift in, you have spotters, you get commands, you lift in wrist wraps and knee wraps. You may not be able to set, sorry, knee sleeves. You may not be able to set all of that up perfectly, but as much of it as you can, because you'd be surprised, like you're nervous at your first time being up there. And if you've only had knee sleeves for a week, you might be like, oh man, my sweaty knees and they're too tight and how do I get it up? And and you, there's a good chance the first time you buy knee sleeves, it'll either be too loose, most likely, or a little or a little too tight, or they are the right amount of tightness, but it's just so foreign to you that you don't know how to put them on. You don't know how to do the wrap technique and pull or all these things, where you don't know how to like hold down your wrist strap with your middle finger while you wrap and unwrap between, between reps, or you don't realize you need to use it on low bar or you get, you know, wrist pain. You know, mm -hmm. uh, or, or you don't know that, oh man, actually for me, my, my, my deadlift belt tightness needs to be slightly looser than my squat tightness because of the, my position on my setup. That may or may not be the case. That's not a universal law. That's just an example of, you don't know those things until you actually start to, to lift in the trenches in a meat simulated environment. So I say, take it all the way and get as close to like a, a mock meet as you can before you actually do the real thing. So that now and you've attended a meet. You've done a mock meet. So when you do hit the platform, you can actually enjoy the experience a lot more and pay attention and be present and learn from it. So that, that, that's my recommendations. Um, one thing I will add is let's talk about like the frequency of competing. 
Typically, people trend towards one of two extremes. I really don't feel comfortable being on the platform until I have quote unquote respectable numbers or I wanna look better in my singlet. It could be a lot of things. There's a lot of, it, it's an anxiety ridden experience getting on the platform uh, for some people, not everyone. Uh, and it's easy to find barriers. And I think it would just really be good to remind yourself how much the community is supportive. And if your community isn't supportive, it's the wrong community. I will guarantee you though, nine out of 10 times, it will be supportive. And I would encourage you to share your fears with some people in the community, because guess what they will have? Memories of having the same struggles. And they'll tell you, you know what, here's what I was afraid of. That didn't happen. It was actually X, Y, and Z. It was pretty cool. Nobody cares. We love to bring people, new people into the fold. And you're going to get a shot of adrenaline and motivation from doing that first meet that's going to propel you. And you're going to make some great progress. And that's pretty much true most of the time. So I think that that's what you, if you're on that end of the spectrum is be open about those fears, understand they're normal and help other people normalize them for you who've been there, who you trust and know. And that'll help you get to a point where you're more comfortable getting on the platform. Other people, however, or even the same people, once they finally do hit the platform, they just, oof, they fall head over heels. Girl or boy powerlifting, I love you. And I think we should mm -hmm. move in together. And and what should we name our kids? And the next thing you, you know, they're doing four to five meets a year. And I think there's nothing wrong with getting meat experience. But at the same time, the mindset of how you approach training, competing for a meet, and some of, depending on the approach you take, the periodization style, doesn't always lend itself towards making this a more ingrained part of your life pattern. And it becomes very easy to ident identify as I am a power lifter and I only get motivated when I'm training for meets. And you can lose some of that first love that you had for the sport uh, when it's not even a sport necessarily. Loving to lift and get stronger. Oh, and I also compete in powerlifting. And that's always a very difficult balance to walk. I've, we've talked about that so much on the podcast. I don't want to spend too much time on it. You know, cultivating uh, a love for your sport, but not being Icarus and fly, flying so close to the sun that it burns you. Not only being motivated by that external reward of getting on the platform, uh, but being able to appreciate it for what it is, even when you're not stepping on the platform. Um, so in my mind, probably the sweet spot is two to three comps a year. Or I'd say one yeah. to three comps a year. Like maybe you just have one local meet you that once a year, that's perfect, you know? Nothing wrong with that. Two, maybe three times per year, I could see that working out just fine if you space it out right. I don't know what you guys think about all that. Yeah, I think, I'd say two is probably the perfect number if there is anything close to that, just because sometimes your first meet doesn't go 100% and you know mm -hmm. you get a get a second try. Um, but um, but yeah, two to three is is perfect. It gives you enough space to... I guess, enjoy your training much in the same way a bodybuilder should enjoy their training when they're in the off season. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, that's, that's the difference between bodybuilding and powerlifting. There's, there's this huge process with many months of dieting before your bodybuilding show Whereas, like with powerlifting and it's like, Hey, you, I've, I've seen people, man, do like six, eight meets a year. Um, just to kind of, do the same thing over and over for, for years and kind of live on that edge, which can be a fun place to visit. But like you said, yeah, you, you don't want to be doing that uh, <laughs> all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and um, Eric, you, you can correct me on this if you, if you need to, but I, I oftentimes feel like true improvement kind of sometimes needs to happen, kind of getting away from competing and getting away from, even in some sense, you know, I'm not going to say totally getting away from powerlifting training, but you need to kind of get away from maximal loads and, and work to increase your work capacity and not just visit there, but kind of live there for a little while. You know, I kind of, mm. that's something that I've really kind of experienced now that I'm working with more higher, more, more high level, um, power lifters is that, um, you need to kind of spend some time in the trenches kind of doing, I'm not going to say bodybuilding work, but maybe bodybuilder ish, you know, and getting that, that work capacity built up. Um, and you can really only do that if you get away from competing for uh, a, a while, you know, and, 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 and then kind of build back up again with that new base that you've, you've kind of uh, um, you've, you've built up through doing, higher volume work with, with, you know, sub maximal loads, lighter, lighter than you might be, you know, have, have traditionally done. Um, I feel like that's important, you know, and like I said, you can, you can correct me if need be, or 
maybe reinforce it with some data that you've got. But that's why another reason why I feel like two to three times a year, three maybe even being a little bit of a stretch for those those higher level um, mm-hmm. power lifters, you know, um, times times a year. Hundred percent agree. Um, no no correction incoming, but maybe an explanation of why for the listener. And we've talked about this a little bit in previous podcasts where I talk about the the value of singles. But like if we talk about our novice here, we go prior to the stage we're talking about now where you're actually competing. You touch a barbell, you're getting stronger, you're getting bigger, right? We recommended that maybe you don't just touch barbells to get bigger, that there's maybe a better approach to that, a little more variety and, uh, you know, less likely to get banged up from just doing a bunch of, you know, barbell specific work. But as you progress through your career, you deal with trade-offs more and more often. You find that you have to rob Peter to pay Paul, that you can't necessarily have your cake and eat it too and get to the highest level for every aspect of fitness. Um, you know, I'll use myself as an example, as someone who competes in strength sport and physique sport. When I, you know, this last uh, buildup where I ended up doing uh, <laughs> garage nationals instead of New Zealand nationals because we went into lockdown like <laughs> five days out, um, I, to hit, my first 500 pound squat to first bench, you know, in the mid three hundreds, that took me like a year of buildup. And yeah, for maybe the first six months, I was, I wouldn't even say sacrificing much from a bodybuilding perspective. It maybe wasn't optimal from a bodybuilding perspective, but I do think I was building muscle. But for the last six months, it was slowly moving from maintenance to maybe even seeing some regression in certain muscle groups. And that was a concession that I'm willing to make because Hey, we understand there's a relationship between volume and intensity. There's only so much total work you can do at the highest intensity. That's why the marathon pace is slower than a 400 meter pace, which is slower than a 100 meter pace. This is why if I told you you need to do 30 total reps with squats, you wouldn't go, sweet, I'll do 30 one rep maxes because you would get crushed uh, and you would have to choose a load that would allow you to mentally and physically handle 30 one rep maxes. So if you're at a high enough level where you have to do repeated frequent exposures to reasonably heavy singles, which in my my example, I was working up to a heavy single in like say the eight to 10 RPE range on squats, three times per week, deadlift uh, once per week and bench four times per week. There's only so much recuperative capacity and joint integrity I have left uh, to do other movements. And there's just a time component and mental burnout and how much actual deliberate practice can i can i focus to those lifts and then go in and go ham on lat pull downs i can do it to some degree but i can't uh realistically kind of have that same kind of work output some can there are some people who are just machines and can be in the gym three hours a day they have a life a mentality and a body that are that are suited for it and they've built up to that over the years i can get kind of close but i i'm not a, a monster and most people aren't when it comes to that so um so yeah so when, when I shift from a powerlifting focus like that, yeah, now I'm doing a whole lot of bodybuilding work and I'm basically thinking, all right, what's the bare minimum amount of powerlifting I could do so I don't backslide too much. So when I go back to a powerlifting phase, I'm not restarting from the ground up. So this is a, a there's, there's far less concessions you have to make when, when you're at the stage of doing your first year of competing, but there is still some. And you find them if you do extreme things like try to compete four times in a year. Uh, when when you're almost always in a phase of doing reasonably heavy singles, and then you find that takes away from some other things. So you really do have to kind of push the limits. But, you know, like there's a reason why it's nice when I'm coaching a powerlifter who wins nationals, you know, like like Bryce or, or, a, or a Jessica Bittner, because they don't have to do the national qualifier to then do nationals to then do an international meet. They can just come back and we can go, oh, nice breath of fresh air. We only have to worry about two meets and we have more time to actually build and progress. Um, so just in this example, at the highest level, two meets is, is, is kind of the luxury if you can get that. And it's a slight advantage. You know, the rich get richer, I guess, a little bit in sports sometimes. But anyway, I won't go into that too much more. One thing I really do want to touch on is the nutritional side of things for the last part of this podcast. You know, people come just like they bring different levels and different fitness backgrounds to when they finally decide, I want to focus on the big three and get on the platform. They bring different food behaviors and bodies to the powerlifting platform the first time. Uh, And I think there's a very easy answer for your maybe quote unquote typical, but perhaps not that typical in in modern times, you know, body instead of food behaviors of someone who has a, a quote unquote normal relationship with food 
and is not really high or really low in uh, in body fat. And that is let your body weight go up as you gain muscle doing what we talked about. You know, don't worry about your weight class for at least the first couple of years of powerlifting and just compete where you settle. And I know as soon as you start looking at numbers, you look at other people, you think about what weight class you're going to be in. You're like, oh, but I'm only, you know, I'm only just seven pounds over the weight class cutoff. Just compete. It's not about that yet. It's about mastering all those other things. And then once you get to a point where, you know, I might actually be able to set a state record or, you know, I might actually be able to qualify for nationals, then we can think about that. However, uh, Berto, I want to ask you, what about the people who, let's say they start powerlifting and they're in the midst of a long-term fat loss phase? You know, they, they got into to the fitness, they've lost 50 pounds already, they want to lose another 50 pounds and they want to start powerlifting the first time. They, they don't know, like, what's, what's the advice for me? Like, should I stop losing weight or is that okay? Or, you know, I think, I think we need to address some of those not so outlier cases that I think are actually quite common that people maybe don't talk about enough. Ooh, um... Actually, when you first said 50 and I want to lose another 50, I'm like, that's a lot. But mm -hmm. but actually, you know, when I think about it, it's more common. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, I guess, the the skinny fat case study that like you, you can't post anything on Instagram without someone uh, you know telling you, hey, I'm skinny fat. You know, from the bodybuilding perspective, what, what do I do? But with powerlifting, um, I, I think sometimes... It's just a, it's a little bit more accepting of all sorts of different kinds of bodies. So mm -hmm. sometimes you might have someone who, yeah, you know, they, they want to lose 100 pounds, like from the moment they, they started on their fitness journey and, and powerlifting caught them about halfway. Um, it, but they gravitate towards it because of that simple reason that, hey, you know, it's like everyone's welcomed here. Um, I, I think this is a fine chance to, especially if, if you've already done some work, um, and we'll go back to the person who maybe we, we caught them from the start. They're like, this is how I choose to recomp my body. Um, you know, just like when we talk to, because we still have this issue, folks, when we talk to our significant others about, or, or just our, our family members about, and friends about this, it's like, they usually tell us what they're going to do and they just want a, approval, you know? Um, and, you know, usually it's, it's not exactly what we would recommend, Right. Um, but the most common one is usually like, Hey, maybe I don't want to lift weights until I get to this point, or, you know, I don't, and putting on muscle is not really a huge interest. Um, and from our perspective, it's like, well, man, you just don't really understand like the power of, uh, that, that lifting weights has in regards to how it impacts, not just your body comp from a numbers perspective, but, but visually as well. Um, so for that person who maybe spent, a good chunk of their time uh, preoccupied with, with losing weight, I think this would be a fine time to learn how to maintain weight because I think that's just a great skill to have in general for powerlifters, for bodybuilders, for just the general public. Um, mm -hmm. And and let the lifting weights the, the, the in a progressive fashion kind of uh, uh, take over. Uh, because one thing you'll see with, with powerlifting or people who've done it long enough, it's like regardless of weight classes, like – uh, I, most of the time you see the folks and to their people, like back home, their friends and families, like they are the fit person, you mm -hmm. know, uh, like they look like an athlete in their clothes. So, um, so yeah, in that case, it'd be like, Hey, let's figure out a way, a system to try to maintain our weight. Uh, you know, of course, you know, it has to have all those prerequisites that, that we talk about all the time, you know, the, like, Hey, can you sustain this? Is this reasonable? Um, but let the lifting of weights do its thing, because if anything, kind of going back to the just weight classes in general, the biggest issue with powerlifters that are kind of uh, like moths just uh, pulled to whatever weight class it is that they, they that they're focused on, um, you end up getting so jacked and so muscular at a certain point that I usually what we hear is you know it's people want to stick to a weight class that they don't really belong in anymore. Um, yeah. so yeah, that would be my advice is, is like, Hey, let the lifting of weights do its thing. And, you know, I think unlike the more cosmetic side of, of lifting weights, like the general fitness side of things, um, this might give you a better environment to actually lift in that way. Cause it's really hard to make strength gains after a certain point when you're just not eating at least enough. Mm -hmm. That's well said. Yeah. The, the, it's always the case studies that really, 
um, excite me, you know, because <laughs> sometimes I feel like I could go on for, for a long time. But yeah, with that particular person, you know, I'm almost, I don't, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just partial, but I feel like anybody that, that has gone through a journey of losing 50 pounds, they probably incorporated some weightlifting in there, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm totally delusional. Maybe they just did strictly cardio, you know? But I, I kind of feel like it's almost mainstream that you need to do some resistance training as part of your your weight loss journey, you know. And so I kind of feel like, well, you know what this this person's done some weightlifting, right? And and so now they've gotten into this this powerlifting um, um, culture, this this powerlifting community, and they it really excites them, and it 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 adds a new set of nuance and some new you know um, reason, you know, some purpose behind their their weightlifting. You know, so now what do we want to do? Um, and for that that particular person, you know, I feel like you can you can t- reason with them a little bit. You know, you can kind of say, okay, well, you know what, you've you've been losing weight on these calories, you know, or you've been losing weight on on these um, eating habits, these these structures of eating, right? Um, let's just eat a little bit more than that. You know, let's let's not. Let's not, like Berto said, let's let the lifting do its thing because the density of muscle is probably going to block your weight loss, your, 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 your lofty weight loss goals that you have now, you know, and it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, you know, um, to kind of let the weightlifting do its thing. Let the, 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 the new muscle be synthesized because I can guarantee you well, I shouldn't say that because, you know, knowledge is so much more prevalent. But in all likelihood, they've been doing what everybody else does on their first fat loss phase, their first fitness Tuesday. They do three sets of 10 of this. They do three sets of 10 of that. You know, it's the it's the leg press. It's the the curls, you know, the couple machines here, a couple machines there. They haven't really done any of the, the, the lower rep ranges, uh, much less maybe not done very much free weight exercise, you know. So there's almost kind of this this form of progression that's happening saying, okay, I don't want you doing three sets of 10 anymore. You know, I just want you doing something a little bit heavier and let's do three sets of eight, you know? And, and, and a lot of that is going to get some, some newbie ish type gains from that. And even if they did stay on the, the lower calories that they were on, yeah, you know what? That's a very good chance that your weight loss is not going to happen anymore, you know, because we're, 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 we're delving into a new, level of, of training that usually re, re, your body responds in, in new adaptations that kind of come from that. And I, f- I feel like as long as you're transparent and, and, and you support the person in their goals and say, look, 50, 50 pounds more weight loss um, is going to look dramatically different than if we gain you know, five pounds of muscle from where you're at right now, you might find out that that actually looks better then 50 pounds lighter, you know, and, and, and kind of support them in what it is that they want to look like, but take away some of the numbers that maybe they had um, preconceived, you know, into their head and talk about all of the, like Berto said, you know, and I say this a lot, just the magic of muscle, you know, it's just, it does so much for the look of your body when a lot of times the numbers don't necessarily make sense. Yeah, that's good stuff. And and I, I think two things. One is, you know, I, I walk in the same circles you do. So I also have the bias that I think, you know, most people who lose weight are probably lifting weights. But I actually know that only is probably true in anyone who's listening to this podcast. So for our purposes, we, we can hold on to that bias and that rosy <laughs> colored view of the fitness world. I'm sure there are plenty of people who unfortunately probably regain those 50 pounds if they're not lifting weights. But that's one minor comment. And two, 100% accurate, Brad. And and it's not magic, but it, it certainly feels like it. Mm. And sometimes it can unfortunately be frustrating. And I'll explain it to you like this. So, you know, most people who've gone through a fat loss phase that's been that successful where you've dropped a good chunk and you're getting into fitness and you're listening to our podcast, you know some of the rudimentary understanding of energy balance. And you've got that whole 3,500 calorie quote unquote rule in your head. And that is a reasonable interpretation of the calorie storage in a pound of fat. But a pound of muscle is mostly protein and water. So a pound of muscle may only be, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 calories of energy that you need to consume. And it doesn't need to necessarily be in a surplus. 
when you have all of this excess tissue on you that can be liberated to replace the energy stores. So I'll give you an example. If you gained two pounds of muscle while you lost two pounds of fat over the course of two months, not unreasonable at all in this newbie phase we're talking about, the scale would stay the same, but you would still be in a deficit because that would be a 7,000 calorie deficit. And then, you know, what does it take to build a couple pounds of muscle? We'll say four or 5,000 calories. So you're in a net four, four to 5,000 calorie deficit, but the scale weight is the same because you're getting those newbie gains like we talked about. So whether you're actually quote unquote eating at maintenance during this phase is not necessarily important, but I think the point that both Brad and Berto made is, is that when you do start taking progressive overload quite seriously, which might coincide with this powerlifting journey we're talking about, just take a break from focusing on the scale weight as a necessary outcome. And instead, what I'd recommend is focus on nutritional structure and having what I would call sports supportive nutrition habits. So get used to having a set number of meals per day. Uh, you know, if you have snacks, probably make them primarily low fat protein source with a little bit of carbohydrate. Each time you sit down from a meal, you want to have either a fruit and or vegetable uh, or at least maybe, maybe a vegetable, maybe and or a fruit. Uh, and then having that, that lean protein serving each time. And like Brad said, you know, if you were purposely in a relatively aggressive fat loss phase and you don't think you can have, you know, a fair amount of carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, lean protein, and multiple meals per day, up your calories. Even if you reduce the deficit a good bit, you're still going to see some favorable body comp. I would say even if you remove the deficit completely, let's say your body fat mass stays neutral and you gain muscle mass, which is, you know, potentially going to happen, or there's a very slight drop in body fat and an increase in muscle, your body fat percentage is improving. And you're going to notice, just like Berto said, that you begin to look more quote unquote athletic. You have more of the physique that you might expect from someone uh, who was, you know, uh, an, an athlete, if you will. So I think you want to let that happen, at least for like, let's say the first year of taking powerlifting pretty seriously, maybe even the first two years. And then you can get to individualize again your, your, your goals. Like if you are someone who you still have another, maybe now instead of 50 pounds, you want to lose 40 or 30 pounds, absolutely go for it. You know, that that's your personal choice. Uh, likewise, on the other end of the spectrum, you might be someone who maybe wants to try moving up a weight class if you're comfortable uh, and, you know, you're, you're, you're mentally and physically healthy in the process of doing that, absolutely go for it. You know, um, there's been a number of powerlifters who've very intentionally gone up a weight class, didn't just gain muscle, gained a fair amount of body fat, but that also put them in a position to be stronger uh, in that weight class. And eventually you will get to the point where you can consider weight cutting and you can trial that the same way we talked about trialing a meat and you can have people who know how to do it properly. Uh, but really, I just, I, I know no one ever listens, but I want to stress this, <laughs> that until you actually get to the point where you are qualifying for something, qualifying for nationals, which is a big deal, especially depending on the country, uh, or, or it can make a difference in some objective manner, I just wouldn't recommend cutting uh, to, for, to make weight because yeah. it's, it's the intermediate trap is what I call it, yeah. where you get really in love with the process of gaining strength at the rate that we're talking about, where every time you step under a squat bar, it's a heavier load. Uh, and you get to a point where now you're an intermediate and it actually takes mesocycles to see progress. And sometimes it doesn't pan out and you have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what happens to actually make that progress. And what seems so easy is going, well, you know, I'm, I'm currently a, an 84. Why don't I just get down with that, that, that 76 weight class and see, see if I'm, I mean, if I had the same total in this weight class down one, I would be moving on from intermediate to advanced. I actually would qualify for nationals. It doesn't work out that way. And what you end up doing is because of your impatience, you hit pause on one of the many years you'll have to put in before you're actually just strong enough to get there in the current weight class you are. Uh, so you, you remove that sport supportive environment nutritionally that I was talking about. Uh, in service of that kind of, you know, fast food fix, as, as Berto might say. Uh, so instead, I would encourage you to just keep creating that environment and 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 make the adjustments you need, both in terms of training methodology that you might need as advanced lifter, but more importantly, in terms of your perspective and expectations on what rate of progress is reasonable now that you're multiple years as not just someone lifting, but actually competing in powerlifting. So... I'll, I'll leave it there. That's all I have to say, gentlemen, on the nutrition front. But there anything else you guys want to add before we close this one out? The floor you is know, yours. I, I think outside of uh, those people who grew up with like Lee Haney posters or or X person on their wall, uh, like generally <laughs> speaking, I think Via just 
powerlifting and eating in the manner that, that you described, Eric, uh, in regards to the physiques that you build, uh, I think they, for most people who really like stick to this for, for many years, they end up with a physique that I think that day one version of themselves would have been like, damn, like that's me. Um, cause like, again, like powerlifting, it's its own thing, but it's close enough to the fitness industry where it's like, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of vanity along with like the, the, like the standards per weight class that draw people, uh, to a certain weight class or keep people at a certain body weight. Uh, cause man, no, I'll tell you what, like, um, usually USAPO nationals here is it's like in a smaller town and I end up just taking the flight with a bunch of powerlifters, um, so it's crazy. First of all, like we get out of there super quick because everyone's super strong. So everyone just pulls their carry on super quick. So it's the <laughs> fastest clearing plane you'll ever be a part of. Uh, but in regards to the physiques, it's like, man, all these men and women with like some real nice booties are just coming up there, the plane. Like I guarantee you when they're walking down that little airport in Scranton or whatever, like everyone's like, holy shit, the Avengers got here. So, um, so yeah, yeah. It just it's amazing what lifting does. Uh, so just speaking to the vanity side of things, cause it's always there, you know, it's like, Hey, not only will I make nationals, but as a 74, I'll have a nice pair of abs too. Mm -hmm. Very true. You know, Eric, I, I, one note that I did make, and I hope that I don't open up a can of worms. that's going to make this conversation last longer than it needs to. But what about the person that has not done any of this? What about the person that's that's jumped on the the powerlifting platform, say in their first year, you know, and and they got so in love with it that they just cannot wait to do it. And you know, maybe they, they left a lot to be desired, and they didn't go six for nine, and and you know, maybe didn't didn't quite get their numbers that they were talking about in training. You know, um, obviously that that conversation could go on for a long time, but. Um, you know, what would be with your advice to somebody that maybe jumped onto the platform a little too soon and now they're, they're kind of wanting to, to regroup and do it right? I think it's a great question. And I don't think it will take too much time, actually. Um, I think the first thing is, is you may frame that as, oh man, I missed out on so much. Mm -hmm. And I would reframe that to say, no, you have the same information that a newbie has with additional experience. You know what it's like to grind. You know what it's like to, to overshoot. You've been to a meet. You've connected with your community. Maybe you didn't, you know, have your sleeves on right that time. You learned a few things the hard way, but you got there. And I think a lot of the things we talked about, you're aware of already. And there are going to be certain things where you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that attempt selection should be like that. Or, oh, shoot, I was cutting for my first meet and it really just made the whole thing less enjoyable uh, I bombed on, on uh, you know, or not bombed. I missed a bunch of attempts. I only got my openers. Um, or yeah, I didn't know about the commands. Those things you do now know. So you'll be able to identify like what's all the stuff we talked about where you had gaps, where they were blind spots. And a few of them, you'll be readily aware of it because it resulted in immediate negative feedback, <laughs> like missing a lift. But a lot of it, maybe you didn't even know that the target was to shoot for. Now you do. And it's not too late. You know, you're, you aren't missing out on that too, too many, on much of your newbie gains or anything like that. Uh, you can always start to reformulate your plan. Uh, and you can, you know, kind of think about, you know what, let's let's have a little bit of amnesia about how, how that meet went. And let me have my, my first prepared meet coming up next year. You know, I'm going to come back to the platform that next time and do, and do all the things right that I got wrong. Uh, and I think that that's probably the perspective that I would recommend, Brad. And it's a great question. How about you, Berto? Uh, it's like when I figured out that calories do matter, like seven, eight years into training, I'm like, <laughs> when I tried it, it worked. It worked great. And and I was able to catch on to it like really quick. I was a macronator within like a week and a half. Um, so, you know, I, I think and I think for most people, ideally, it's like, yeah, I'd love to grab a 16 year old kid at the gym and be like, hey, like, we'll get you on that platform in like six months to a year. Uh, but that's not usually how it is. So I think most people, they're going to have a certain level of, uh, of things that, yeah, they learned the hard way and they, they didn't get on the right track, like 100%. Um, so it, stage it, it, rate it's of 188 exciting. and 07, <laughs> 158 and 08. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it worked out. It worked out. And, uh, and that's exactly how I took it. It was just like, oh, wow. Okay. So now I have some new stuff to add to my arsenal. And I knew exactly where to apply it. So, 
Mm-hmm. Awesome. So yeah, gents, that's that's all I've got. So, Berto, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Uh, uh, really quickly, I guess just advanced powerlifter. It's like get a coach <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for sure. Get a coach and uh, a, a group of training partners that are not yes men, and <laughs> we're good. I think. Um, but they usually find that out on their own, you know. Don't get hurt. <laughs> oh, yeah, get, absolutely. Get hurt less is probably a more realistic piece of advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, I think we covered every every angle on this, and uh, hopefully, for those who who saw prep positioning and you're like, that looks awesome, and it is because it covers every angle of of how to get you in the best spot to be a successful bodybuilder. That we've given you a bit of that for those who are uh, platform junkies. Big three boys and girls, those who are all about putting up those those grinders and then calling them a seven RPE and knowing that they're lying but smiling <laughs> while they do it on the gram. We got you covered. Uh, we hope this was enlightening. Uh, please do share it. Give us a rating and review. Let all your, your, your aspiring powerlifting friends and family know how to do this thing right and set them up for success. Thank you for listening, and we'll hear you. We'll, we'll be here next time on the 3DMJ podcast. What's going on 3DMJers, Eric Helms here. Thanks for listening to our podcast. I just want to take a second to tell you about MASS, Monthly Applications in Strength Sport. This is a monthly research review that I put out with Greg Knuckles, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Dr. Eric Trexler. We cover the most up-to-date, peer-reviewed research in the world of strength and physique sport that's directly relevant to your practice as a coach or an athlete. We provide our reviews in written format, but also, since you enjoy our podcast, in audio roundtable reviews where we discuss the research in depth. Finally, we also do video concept reviews where we cover a broader topic and video format for your learning. For fitness professionals, you can take quizzes on mass content and earn continuing education credits for most of the biggest certifying bodies in the fitness industry. If you want to sign up and get a subscription, head over to 3dmusclejourney.com and click on the products tab. Thanks for your time and thanks for listening.